Welcome to another episode of Higher Learning. I am your host, Oz Rashid, and today we have a very special guest, CEO and founder of Kepra, Julie Kring. Julie, how are you doing? I'm doing very well. How are you doing, Oz? I'm good. I'm so grateful for you spending some time with us. Climate technology is something that um, is, 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 is on the tip of everybody's tongue. You're reading about it every day in the news. Um, I'm grateful enough. I'm getting to meet a lot of people in this space. It's such an exciting place and, and, and it's so impactful for our world. So I'm I'm really excited to learn a little bit more about it. I want to start there because I want to learn a little bit about your company. And you had an amazing career in science before founding Kepra. So I'm really interested. Is that something that was always in you as a child? Or is that something that developed later on in life? How did this 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 love and passion for science and chemicals, when did it find you and how how did that happen? Yeah, well, I uh, I give all the credit to my dad. He indoctrinated me, indoctrinated me from a very early age on the power of technology and how it can solve problems fundamentally. Uh, he's a PhD in electrical engineering and computer science from UC Berkeley and spent a whole long career as kind of a serial VP of engineering in these weird nitty gritty technology startups. Um, and I was always fascinated by his work. Uh, but what got me interested in climate tech was actually just outside of my grandma's house. Um, they were looking to sell land leases for natural gas fracking. And I'm very protective of her. She's a lovely lady. So I um, I turned to my dad. I'm like, what are we going to do about this? And he said, well, you know, there's something called biofuels. And uh, this can help us prevent unnecessary fracking in, in some of the world's most beautiful and wild places. So those two things really collided for me. And I've been on this track ever since. Oh, I got to ask. So what ended up happening? Were you able to save grandma's house or? <laughs> Actually, the Sierra Club saved grandma's house. Uh, so hats off to those people. Um, yeah, no, it was. It's always interesting with climate tech. There's a really interesting intersection of public policy, technology, funding, all of that. And it's it's a huge ecosystem. For sure. For sure. I'm learning that there's so many different moving parts to it. Um, I'm excited to find out more about Kepra. So let's talk about that because just because you're passionate about science and just because you see um, a potential issue that you want to solve, that doesn't mean you always start a company. So I'm interested. Tell me a little bit about Kepra, a little bit about its mission, and then ultimately how you decided to make this move and what your ultimate vision is long term for this. Yeah, well, as I mentioned, my dad introduced me to biofuels and then I watched that whole rise and fall very, very closely. One of the problems I noticed uh, with biofuels is if you are using fossil fuel to make energy from biomass, uh, the energy balance, the sort of energy accounting of that is not actually all that good. Mm. So, and, and then you're also polluting by burning all this fossil fuel to make sort of fossil fuel substitutes. So I thought, why don't we come up with an electrified system? Um, and serendipitously, I had a friend who's a physicist, she was studying physics at the time, whose father is uh, the head of this office for a group called Kaijo Shibuya, and they sell ultrasonic equipment. And so she and I kind of exchanged ideas, and her dad actually gave me some free equipment. It was really lovely. Um, and that started my whole journey into sonochemistry, which is a very weird, very niche field. But um, learning how to apply sonochemistry has been instrumental in getting to where we are today. Yeah, I love that. And, and listen, something that I, I tell a lot of entrepreneurs, as soon as you you get to some level of success, you know, we have this ability to look back and think that was me and that was, or maybe that was some people around me, but luck and opportunity play so much into this. I remember reading one of the Malcolm Gladwell books where he talked about Bill Gates, right? Grew up in Seattle. And it was just so happens that his mom worked at, I think the University of Washington, which was one of the first place that had access to computers. And so he would spend late nights in there playing on the computer, which fundamentally allowed him to create Microsoft and have kind of this, this genius in him that if not for that opportunity, who knows? So it's really interesting to hear in terms of Kepra and, and, and your having that serendipitous moment and that leading to where you're at right now. In terms of the, the vision of the company, where, 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 how will you define success? How will you define, is it, is it a financial metric? Is it a uh, impact metric? Like how, how are you defining that long-term for the company? Yeah, um, I would say that a lot of clean tech op entrepreneurs actually have the same ethos, which is carbon emissions is very important to reduce, of course, but there's also a whole host of different environmental factors that can be protected and, and problems in those environmental places can be solved with technology. So um, 
particularly in where we focus on agrochemicals, everybody knows glyphosate, pesticides, oh, terrible. And um, it's true. It's actually true. But um, that's not necessarily a carbon emissions problem. That's that's a pollution problem. Yep. And, um, you know, if you're a hippie mountaineer like me, you start to see how important species and forests and and all that kind of come together in maintaining the climate. And um, I think it's not, you can't just focus on one singular metric. You have to focus on land use, on carbon emissions. Financial metrics are important too, because uh, you know nobody wants to fund something that's not profitable, uh, but it all comes together into building a new industry that's cohesive with the natural spaces around us, as opposed to you know inherently destructive. Yeah, I really love that. Can I ask you a question? Because I'm kind of I'm obviously a layman here. I care about the environment. I care about climate technology. I'm not in the weeds like you and your team are day to day. My sense is that there's been a lot of progress made at a global and national level over the last two to three years. Certainly not enough. There's a lot more to do. But am I am I wrong in thinking that there's been some real progress? Are you seeing positive and optimistic signs as we push forward as a as a world, as a community, as a nation? I'm very optimistic, and you can definitely see. Um, particularly in large companies that are kind of known as the, the biggest polluters, that there's a bit of a schism. There's definitely the more conservative types that want to hold on to oil production. But there are also companies out there that are very, very actively and aggressively pursuing novel technologies, new materials, new fuels. Um, and it's impressive to see. So, you know, I don't necessarily see oil people as inherently bad and or anything like that. I think that it's best to kind of show uh, and demonstrate that these new technologies are actually just superior and it's time for a new age of industry. And I love that. That's a great way to influence. You know, we're going to talk about hiring in a minute, but we shared in an earlier conversation kind of the stereotypical idea of a startup, right? We got three or four young techies working out of a garage. You've gone about building your team in a lot different way. And I found it to be so interesting. Tell me a little bit about the hires that you brought in and, and some of your beliefs on the team building that led to these decisions. Yeah, yeah. Well, a lot of people know about Silicon Valley ageism, and I would say that I'm very, I don't believe in that at all. Um, I don't believe in four whiz kids in a garage. I think that there's no substitute for experience because people who have done something before are able to do it again and again and again, and they already know where the pitfalls are. So I've worked with um, you know, a consultant who is the VP of engineering at this incredible company, Lanzatech. I gush about this company all the time. Um, and we brought him on. It, it took me five minutes to make a decision just because I knew that he had gone through exactly what I needed to go through in the next few years. Uh, with my CTO, uh, he's a great electrical engineer, but I brought him on because he had already built and sold a company. And I knew that from an experience perspective, you know, that's something that I was lacking. And it's important to create these foils between yourself and your team and understand what are the roles that you actually need to fill? And sometimes that's a little bit outside of the job description. Sure. And listen, I, I think that, you know, sometimes this stuff happens organically. Don't get me wrong. You, you're with your peers, you get into a garage, you create a software, what have you. But I also think, and we see this in hiring of all types, right? There can be a an insecurity or an ego about it, right? And what I'm hearing from you is there's a real humility in understanding I haven't been where some of these other people have been and they can help me get there. I can learn from that experience. And that doesn't, um, become an insecurity for you. That becomes a power of yours, right? And so I think that humility is something that's really important in leadership that we don't always see. Because whether we realize it or not, there's a lot of conscious and unconscious biases that come into our hiring. And we tend to look at things through our lens and how is this going to impact me? And so I want to give you major kudos in kind of fighting through some of that that you might see with, with typical founders trying to start their own organization and leaning on and building a team that's going to help you get where you want to go. I think that's incredible. Um, the other big stereotype with, with startups is this idea of proselytizing hustle culture, right? As this aim to pursue. I wake up at 5 a.m., I take a cold bath, I eat steel oats, I read two books, I meditate, and then I get in at 6 a.m. and beat my entire company in, right? This idea of if you're if you're sleeping, you're you're falling behind. If you're taking time to spend with your family, then you're just not that obsessed. Um, you mentioned to me that you lead a little bit differently. You you talked about love and hiring the whole person, something that I talk a lot about here at MSH in terms of hiring the whole person, and that they don't have to sacrifice their entire personal life to join your company. I'm interested where that came from and how that manifests itself at your company currently. 
Well, it comes from two things. Um, one of them is just observation of these very, very famous visionary leaders. Um, you know, take Elon Musk as an example. His whole management ethos is to drive people into the ground. And you can see at his companies, Tesla and SpaceX, they have a higher turnover rate than anyone else in their industry. And that's that's fundamentally a flaw because you're losing people who know the business very well and already you, training people costs money. So you want people who are both inspired to work hard for sure, but also um, you need to develop that experience on your team. And um, and so the other side of that is I mentioned there's this book by Bell Hooks. It's all about love. And she talks about love as an action and it has pillars that you have to live um, and bring with you to all of your relationships and it's commitment, it's understanding, it's it, there's a variety of important things. Um, but the way that people feel loved is when you do all of these things. It's not when you say these things. And I think that that's a huge flaw in leadership as well as when we say, um, you're doing great, you're doing great, but you just need to work another 10 hours more. And also I'm gonna poke at your insecurities to make you work harder. And I think that that's, that's toxic, frankly. It's a toxic work environment. So in the book, there's a chapter where she says, why can't we bring love to the workplace? And that really resonated me, with me. And so far it's worked as well. Um, I mentioned my CTO, he has three kids. And um, it's important, you know, particularly since I had my dad who was working in startups and I, I know exactly what it's like to be one of those kids. Um, you know, there's there's nothing you're going to regret more than having your kid feel resentful towards you or resentful towards your job or your life passion. Uh, so it's OK to create space for that. It's important to create space for that because that's the kind of person that is going to feel creative. That's the kind of person that's going to want to have the best interests of the company in mind. And I think, you know, it's, it's important to lead with love. Yeah. Uh, three kids, huh? Amateur. I got four kids. So I, I know all about that life. Um, here's what I'll say. And I'll go back to what the, 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 the analogy you made about Elon Musk and the grinding the people into the ground. I really believe that as a society, we have fundamentally gone away from the command and control leader. Right. And I think there's generational thing there. I think there's a access to opportunity thing out there. I think there's a optionality bias that we have now out there that leading only that way going forward is not going to be effective and sustainable long term. And I think what I've heard him say is that, hey, we are trying to change the world positively, whether it be Tesla, whether it be SpaceX, we're doing these things. And to do that requires sacrifice and demand and and all these different things. And I, I, I agree with that. Being part of something bigger than yourself, being part of something that's mutually beneficial does require sacrifice. But that doesn't mean that you can't look at the whole person, that you can't take into account the other sides of their life. Because what you said about children being resentful towards their parents and their work because they're not getting the time with their parents, just on a long enough timeline, that makes the parents resentful at what's taking them away from their kids and makes you no longer as productive or as engaged. And you're going to lose a lot of great talent that way. So listen, I think that there's room in the workplace for asking for sacrifice for employees, having expectations for your employees, holding a high bar for your employees. But you can't be that 24-7. You also have to give the other way too and say, take a day off, take a week off, take a sabbatical, go home and be with your kids. Tuesdays are date night, whatever it may be. You have to, that's effective leadership in my mind. There has to be some level of holding people so they can do their best work and hold them to account. But you don't have to do that in a way that it's my way or the highway, or you're just not as bought in if you don't work till 6 a.m. every morning, right? And sleep under your desk. So totally aligned with you on that. I'm a big believer in that, you know, leadership takes adaptiveness. And I do think that while there's room for holding people to, to, to where you want them to go and do their best work, there's also a lot of room for taking in that whole person in love and having empathy. And so I think that's a really important thing that you're doing. I'm going to keep up with you because I want to hear how it keeps going as your company grows and scales. I want to talk about that growing and scaling. Is that a segue? What a professional segue. We're now going to ask about hiring and what is important to you about hiring. Here's why we talk about this so much, okay? I don't believe that there's financial services companies or retail companies or technology companies. I believe all companies are people companies. People build the technology, people build the sales model, people build the marketing plan. And so inherently, you have to take care of the people so that they can do all those byproducts of their work. And so that's why I think hiring 
is so important. Developing, retaining your people is so important, if not the fundamentally most important thing in every business. I know as a CEO and leader, you see that impact day to day. I am positive you probably made a bad hire that really impacted things in a negative way. And I'm sure you've made other hires, like it sounds like your CTO, that have really changed the game for the better. So that's why that's why we talk about this as much as we do here at this company and here on this podcast. So let's get into it. Do you have an overall hiring philosophy? Is it only centered on love or are there other aspects that we can get into and hear about in terms of when you're looking to hire somebody, what you're looking for? Yeah, yeah. Um, I wish I had written it down and created a strategy, but I would say that the most important thing you have to look for is honesty. Um, and that means when you're sitting there across the table from somebody and saying, you know what, we are going to go here and we're going to need this, um, encouraging them to say whether or not they actually are capable of that as well. Because that's an important thing about hiring is you need to hire the best person for the job. And, um, and that's how you reduce the amount of friction between yourself as a manager and the person that you've hired is, yes, of course, it's very important to develop people. It's important to acknowledge that there's going to be flaws. There's going to be places where somebody needs to learn more. But, um, you know, I, as you said, I've, I've made bad hires with people who just um, weren't, weren't ready for that role. And um, it's better to just kind of acknowledge that and to be able to say, you know what, um, you know, I'd love, you're a great person. I'd love for you to be a part of this company. This role is not quite right because we need, we need this from you. Um, and yeah. I think that's such an app comment on your part. Like, I think like everybody loves the word integrity. It's one of our values. It's a lot of companies' values. Integrity is about your say do, your reliability, your the amount that you come through, your honesty. But I think what people miss in that equation a lot of the time is, yes, of course, you know, doing everything you can to make sure you make good on your word is super important. But knowing your capability, being self-aware and honest with yourself on what you're capable of doing is also a big part of that because it doesn't matter if you're you're killing yourself to make sure you come through on your commitments. If you give commitments that you can't, you don't know that you're capable of or not, then you're going to be failure more often than not in those types of situations. And that's a big component of integrity that I don't think everybody talks about. I think you're really right. And sometimes it's not you know done like in a conscious way. Sometimes it's not done in an intentional way. It's just that some people aren't self-aware of what they can and can't get done. And if that's the case, then you can't rely on them to meet deliverables, to meet timelines, to come through on commitments. I think that's a really apt thing that you're saying. If I ask you about a memorable interview, right? Bad or good, you don't got to name names, but are there any interviews that stand out to you that one way or another really kind of uh, ring in your head when I ask you about that? Yeah, yeah. Um, we we hired a batch of interns once and our final question was, okay, with items that you have in the room, make something and explain what it does. Just invent something right here. And um, this poor this poor kid was on vacation with his family in Hawaii, and he was in a room with like a printer and a birdcage and a piece of paper. <laughs> and Whoa! He he pulled it out. He pulled it out of his uh, his butt. It was amazing. And um, what did he I invent? That, Do you remember what he invented? He was just, it a birdcage printer? I've just, always needed one of those. He gave a whole pitch on. Uh, basically like this is a new item for a pet store and it's to be able to take care of your pets and that's sort what of, so it was it was very it was a very simple object but it was i i really admired the tenacity where he was like oh my gosh okay i'm on the spot and then he just grabbed what he had and, and did something with it and I, it's very admirable i love that creativity i gotta ask you like when you i imagine that you typically probably want to hire people that are passionate about changing the world and climate and climate technology in particular do you look for that even at the intern level? Is that something that has to already be bubbling in them? Or is that something like maybe you can learn when you come here? I would say at the intern level, most more often than not, uh, people don't really know what they want to do with their career. True. Uh, we do ask when we're hiring interns, but and it does tend to be that on the spot answer like, oh, the, the, the planet. But a lot of younger people, particularly in Gen Z, already inherently care about changing very true. climate for the better. Um, so, you know, that's kind of a given for me. What I really look for in an intern in that regard is um, like the willingness to see how their specific projects and their specific past experiences could potentially be leading them into a career in climate. 
And um, even if it's even if it's an off the cuff answer, I think it's really important. Yeah. Yeah, they 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 don't always know what they want to do at that age. I'm still trying to figure out what I want to do professionally, so I, I can't get that upset with them. Um, do you have a favorite question that you love to ask in an interview? I I, I do actually. I always ask, uh, "What do you do to get outdoors?" Because I'm I'm very outdoorsy. It's important uh, for me culturally, I would say. Um, and yeah, I've gotten some weird answers. Like one, one was, I like to chop wood. I go outside and I chop wood for hours. I'm like, that's wow. That sounds like a good stress reliever. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> Just go out there and chop some wood. But, um, but to the point of like leading with love and seeing the whole person, it's, I, for me, it's important to see how a person maintains their health and in my philosophy, being outdoors, getting vitamin D, that's a really big part of that as well. So that's part of the culture I'd like to build at Kepra. Yeah. So I, I got to ask, is there anything that you do? Like, does, like, do you have like mandatory walk time or is there like an open atrium or like, is there anything you do to get people to get outside so they're not in the office all the time? Um, you know what? No, I, I'm not very dictatorial in that way. I would say I just more like, um, a willingness to uh, let a person go out and take the time that they need. So I love that. Um, even, even myself, you know, sometimes it's like, yeah, I just need to take a three day weekend. I'm going to go, go up this mountain. It's, it's just part of how I deal with, with stress actually. And so, um, you know, I think if somebody has the drive to maintain their health and be active, then they're going to want to do that inherently. And it's just creating space. I love that. I mean, one of the things we, we have a similar mindset, we want wellness, both mentally and physically. For our team, we provide we try to provide a lot of benefits on both sides of that, whether it be Headspace app, whether it be memberships to gym, whether it be, I think we've done like yoga and corporate runs and things like that. And so we try to build that into the culture and then hire people that that's important to. And so that really stands out to them. I actually have one of our people leaders every week. She does her check in with her team and they they go like they're gone for like an hour. I'm like, where are they at? They're out walking around Fort Lauderdale in the beautiful sun, assuming that it's not raining and uh, taking in and getting a little bit of that vitamin D. So I love it. I think that's a really smart thing and uh, maybe mandatory walk time, something to think about. Um, when you miss on somebody, because you said earlier you did and we all do, um, is there something that maybe you can look back as a theme of when you miss on somebody, what happened? Yeah. Um, well, you mentioned self-awareness and I would say that that was probably the fundamental issue. Um because I think if somebody's self-aware, that then they can acknowledge where their competencies lie and where their incompetencies lie. And you can work with them. You can kind of have a give and take on where they actually fall. So I don't think you need to ax everybody that is, you know, not quite living up to expectations. But um I would say that when you start to sense levels of passive aggression, passive aggressive behavior, that's like that's a big, big red flag. And I personally made the mistake of letting that go on for way too long because um, it just creates log jams. It really creates breakdowns of communication and um, you find out that they were doing something that you didn't want them to do or they had messed something up and then they covered it up. And, um, you know, it, it really has less to do with like the capabilities with the person and more the ability to reorganize the team in order to accommodate different skill levels. Passive aggressiveness, I think, is one of the least desirable qualities we want in a friend, in a mate, in somebody we work with. And really what it is, is it's a sign of contempt is really what it comes down to. It's contempt boiling up to the top in a very different and unique way. So I am with you. That needs to be rooted out as, as quickly as possible. Last hiring question. In terms of giving somebody a realistic job preview of what it's like to work at Kepra, is there anything you do in the interview process? Is there anything you have your team communicate? What, what what do you try to do to create an experience that gives them an idea of what to expect at working at your company? Yeah, so I would say that this is unique to startups because we can be a little bit more bendy about these things. But oftentimes I will um, basically make a decision very quickly, but we'll go on a contract period and almost like an advisory role. Like I said, I take on people who are, are a little bit later in the career, very, very accomplished. And, um, and then I get a feel for them first. And then we, and then we work it out from there. So I think that's, that's definitely a little different from, you know, how more start established companies work. But, um, like I said, it helps me understand exactly who the person is. Oh, I got to ask the provocative question now. So when it's been somebody that you tested it out and it didn't work out, what's that conversation like? I haven't had, 
had one yet, actually. Um, okay. Yeah, I, I guess I'm a pretty decent judge of character, but yeah, no, the people have worked out pretty well so far. That's awesome. Um, so listen, you are the founder and CEO of a growing company in the climate tech space. I'm sure there's a lot of people sitting here wondering what you spend your day doing. So what, how do you break down your day for us? What are you, I mean, I imagine you're in a lot of meetings, but are you, are you, are you, are you working with actual R and D? Are you talking to investors? Are you, you know, getting the team engaged? Like how, how do you spend your day? Where do you, where do you find your most uh, productive time is? Yeah. Yeah. All of the above, frankly. Um, I am sort of the chemist of the team. And so I do spend a lot of time interacting with, we've built university partnerships. And so I'm the main point of contact on that. I do also kind of guide those, those projects. Um, I fundraising is a huge part of the job and it takes a lot of time. Um, and, but I do also like to set aside some time for, for more deep work. There's always outside of emails as well. Like I do a lot of emailing, but um Part of what's important is also uh, getting down a strategy on paper. That's a mistake that I made in the past as well, as I kept it all up here and then I tried to explain it, but it's easier for somebody to just read it. Um, but, and then I do spend a lot of time one-on-one -on -one with my core team members as well, where I, I, it's important to just kind of set the, set the record straight on where we're going this week, this month. And um, it's also important for them to know what I'm doing because otherwise it's like, well, what, what does she do all day? And it's uh, setting those goals, even for myself, helps me stay productive as well. I really love that transparency. Is there anything in particular the company's working on right now that you're really excited about? Yeah, yeah, actually. Tell me, um, that's what we're here for. <laughs> yeah. So so we built this, we built a chemical reactor. It's electrified, it's, it uses sound, it's, it's all very cool. But uh, we're working with a professor at Texas Tech University on being able to make ammonia using ultrasound, using nitrogen gas, water, and electricity, which would be way more sustainable than the way that we do it. 25% um, of the world's ammonia for fertilizer and all that comes from Russia, and it's one of the most energy-intensive processes in the world. It's massively pollutative. And um, so being able to succeed in this would be definitely a game changer. Wow. I'm learning new things all the time. I had no idea that Russia had that much of a hold on the, the ammonia economy. Very cool. And so Texas <laughs> Tech, does that mean you have to go out to Lubbock? Have you spent any time out there yet? Or is it more just interaction virtually? It's interaction virtually. Yeah. So a lot of the reason why it kind of works for me to be the CSO as well as CEO, CEO is um, all of these professors can work sort of autonomously. And it's mostly just communicating back and forth on the, the concepts and the ideas. And then they kind of pass it down to their, their grad students. Okay. I got to ask you a bonus question before we get to our last question. What's the best part of going to UCSD? The best part of going to UCSD? Oh, man. Um, I had a lot of fun at UCSD. There's, I mean, there's the beach. Tell me that you weren't in the Andy chemistry doesn't... lab the entire time. Please tell me you're out enjoying <laughs> oh, absolutely La Jolla and I was... Gaslight District and all that. Yeah, oh, I went down to the gas lamp and down to the beach, Pacific Beach. Uh, I was on the UCSD ski team. And so we would Friday, Friday. Water skiing, I assume, class, right? Ice skiing. We would drive like seven hours back and forth every weekend, oh. go up to Mammoth and just kind of go hard on those slopes. It was Okay, great, so great when fun. like the team from Wyoming and Montana shows up and they're like, oh, we're up against the San Diego team. They're thinking you guys are going to be a walkover. <laughs> and then you just crush them. Is that how it goes? No, we were so bad. It was, it was bush leak, but it was it was a great fun. I love that. That's awesome. See, that's the type of insight I'm looking for right there. All right, last question. If you had to amplify one nugget of career advice that you know now that maybe you did not know early on in your career for maybe somebody getting started, what would that be? I would say that vision is good. And I actually look back on my my like kind of journal writings from the start of Kepra. I'm like, who is this megalomaniac? Wow. They think they're going to change the world. And I'm so much more cynical now, but um, the importance is always on execution, always, always on execution. And um, it's going to hurt when you go and talk to somebody and they say essentially that you haven't executed enough. So that's something that happens a lot in fundraising or in, or in that sort of thing is you need to take it a little bit further before we're ready and um, it's really easy to take that personally. It's really, really easy to take that personally, but um, you kind of have to shake that off and 
have the self-awareness, like you said, to be like, okay, yeah, this company isn't ready for this VC firm or, or what have you. Um, I need to do this, this, and this in order to, to actually execute on the vision that I was so, so passionate about when I started. And um, the only way out is through, frankly. And when tough times and good times, it's you just have to go through it and, um, yeah, not take things personally. Yeah, I think one thing entrepreneurs or people wanting to become entrepreneurs, you know, it's not about an idea. It's not even about a vision, right? You can have a very clear vision. It's great because eventually you're going to have to get people on board on that, whether it be team members or investors or partners or whatever it may be. So it's probably a necessary skill. But at the end of the day, like you have to have something tangible that matters when building a business, whether you are a salesperson, whether you are an operations person, whether it's talent and people is your is your area of expertise. Like fundamentally, that's what you're going to have to do for the business along with everything else, taking out the trash, marketing, sales, mining, whatever it is. You've got to, you've got to have a skill set that is about building a company, not just an idea. And so I think that is something that sounds like, you know, you 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 fought through through the initial part of your career and it's it's brought you to a very successful place. Listen, I know you said something about being a little more cynical right now. I want you to keep your optimism as high as possible. We need people like you doing what you're doing. So grateful to have you on the show. I really appreciate you coming on, Julie. Yeah, it was great talking to you. All right. Have a good one. Thanks so much. You too. Bye. Thank you.